Okay, so we're going to talk now about the solution for homework number seven. Okay, uh, so here I have the solution, and it's going to be posted in a few minutes by Jeffrey. Uh, the first problem was uh, a problem which is called uh, typically uh, it's a workflow to make a stress log. So basically uh, this stress log uh, you get it by uh, using the data of mass density wave velocity and shear wave velocity uh, with with all of those uh, you can calculate the elastic constants of the rock the stiffer the rock the faster the velocity is in the rock and uh, um, with with that you can calculate what is the constraint modulus of the rock and assuming that there is a tectonic strain and uh, with the Poisson ratio 2, you can tell what is the horizontal stress. So this is sort of an expanded version of what we used before just with uh, calculating the stress as a sink at, the, at the given depth and saying, for example, uh, the horizontal stress is going to be <coughs> given by this formula, okay? Uh, we're using that formula together with the part of the tectonic strain that if I remember correctly is like this <coughs> EH and, uh, and there is another one uh, over here but we apply this now line by line basically the assumption here is that we have a layer medium in which we can apply this equation line by, by line so for each of these lines you're doing exactly that you're calculating the stress according to that equation so let's see how the solution looks like uh, the first thing that you had to do was to load the data uh, there you had information for what the pore pressure is and you know how to calculate by now very well the vertical stress so total vertical stress is this line over here and uh, the pore pressure is this other line over here at this place particularly this was a relatively shallow reservoir notice that this <coughs> is about uh, 700 meters which is uh, half a mile more or less not not too deep and uh, the overpressure parameter at that location it's, it's not hydrostatic if it would be hydrostatic it would be somewhere over here uh, but it is not it's higher than that and also when you analyze the data and again you utilize these equations uh, you can calculate what the Yon modulus is and uh, and the Poisson ratio and when you plot that data you should get something which is looks more or less like this where here you have the Poisson ratio measured from the P waves and also the dynamic uh, YAM modulus uh, measured uh, from the, the logging uh, data as well uh, so what do you do after that? then uh, we use what is called a conversion factor to go from the dynamic YAM modulus to the static YAM modulus and in this case the, the equation is static is equal to the factor that goes from dynamic to static times the dynamic where always this factor FDS is smaller than one and this is something else very important to remember usually the stiffness that you measure uh, with well logging tools is much higher than the actual stiffness of the rock uh, why? because the waves usually deform the rock just a little bit 
And when you actually do depletion or you do hydraulic fracturing, you deform a rock a lot more than what you would do with a wave. So a wave you know, is something you can't see. It's very small, very tiny. And uh, usually when you do something uh, like a hydraulic fracture or as I say depletion, that's going to be a much higher strain. In order to get this parameter, that's something we didn't talk about, but what is done is you measure what is the static modulus in the lab, usually with a triaxial cell, the same way that you did in the lab. And on the other hand, you measure this from, from the log. And also you can do it in the lab sometimes. If this will be the same, you will have a line here one to one where all the data plots. But as I told you before, always these static moduli are smaller than that one. So usually you get something for a given rock, which looks something like this. You throw a line over there. And from here, you get, from that correlation, uh, you get uh, what is your uh, conversion factor. Do you guys know more or less how, how much it costs to get one of these points in a, in a laboratory, in a commercial laboratory? $10,000? Uh, one point, OK? So w you're telling me that for 10 points, it will be 100000 uh, In some places, it might be like that. But uh, the numbers I have is more or less one test of this. It's about three thousand dollars, so three four thousand dollars. So, if you need to do this, you know, for many points or for uh, an extended uh, core, it can get a little bit more expensive. Uh, you got a question? Yeah, do you do like these for free at CT? No, we don't do it for free. Uh, we don't do it either for consulting, but uh, we do it for research. Yeah. Okay, so. Uh, now we have the static modulus, uh, dynamic modulus. Uh, here you have it in gigapascal. Here you have it in uh, thousands of psi, and uh, this is it doesn't get even to one million psi. So it's, this is a relatively soft rock. It's shallow and it's also relatively soft. Uh, after this, uh, you can calculate what what is the static plane strain modulus, which is going to be a little bit higher than the, than the YAM modulus. And after you do that, you use the equations that we discussed before. And adding that component of the tectonic strain is going to allow you to calculate layer by layer what is the stress. And you're going to get something that looks uh, more or less like, like this. So vertical stress and uh, horizontal stress maximum, horizontal stress minimum. Notice that this is very similar to what I gave you in the exam, right? It's, it's exactly the same procedure. That one may have a few more things, a, a few more knobs to turn, but in essence, it's, it's exactly the same. Uh, and the question now is, uh, what happens if you start a hydraulic fracture, uh, you put some perforations at the depth of, uh, can you guys rem remind me what was the depth of the perforations before I show the solution? Uh, 2,130, 2,160, right? So this is 2,130, 160. It will be put in perforations in this region. Before we answer that, what is the stress regime at that depth? Normal faulting, Normal faulting right? Because we have SH min, SH max, and SV. But notice that in this case, as a function of depth, we also have a change of the stress regime. For example, what is the stress regime uh, now at this location? Strike slip, right? And we could find, for example, a point over here where it gets into reverse, right? Uh, so calculating this variation for stress is very important. And if we were to put 
uh, perforations here and start a hydraulic fracture, that hydraulic fracture very likely will start by filling up this region where the minimum principal stress is smaller than the, the vertical stress. And then you will find these bumps of high uh, horizontal stress. Uh, so let me go to the answer. Here, Jeffrey already did that. If you were to initiate a fracture at this point, very likely this one will grow if we do a cross section. Put the perforations there, it will start like this, it will bump into this location and only after it has enough pressure uh, to overcome those stresses, it might grow up or grow down. And, and if, it, if it grows down, it will extend and it will propagate uh, in this direction till it reaches again that uh, lower boundary. Let me see if I find something else in here. Uh, what do you think it would happen if we get to to that point and, and let's assume for a minute that that stress is actually higher than the vertical stress and if the fracture continues to propagate uh, what will it happen in that case you will see something like this this is a hydraulic fracture which is propagating down if it goes let's say this is uh, normal faulting or strike slip, it will be a vertical fracture. But if it gets into a reverse faulting regime, it will turn and it will start propagating like this. This is what is called a T-shaped fracture. And it happens because you have a change in the in the faulting regime at that location. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, this is the end of problem number one. Uh, did you guys have any problems in solving this problem? No. Okay. So what do I expect from you? I expect that you know how to read these stress logs. I, I'm not going to ask you to do these com computations for a table of say a hundred rows or a ten rows or even five rows. It's too much, okay? But uh, you need to know how to do it at least for one row. You need to know the basics, how to use equation, the tectonic strains, how to compute this strain moduli, how to compute the dynamic modules from the P waves. You don't have to memorize equations, but you know you need to know how to use them, okay? Yes, Ms. Montero. Say, uh, what the height of the would be? So, in this case, uh, the height of the fracture, th there are two, right? If you were to just uh, inject the beginning with a relatively low pressure, it will grow uh, about 100 feet. But if it extends the, the whole way, it will go more or less. Uh, up to here and here we see that we have about uh, 300 and something feet okay so it's a total of to say 350 where this lower one if we just consider this section is about 200 feet Again, you know, th th there is no simple answer for this. Uh, and it, this is subject to interpretation. Uh, but, but you need to recognize those stress boundaries and when those uh, stress regimes uh, change uh, from normal faulting to strike slip or from uh, strike slip to reverse faulting. All right, are we good with this one? Okay, let's go to the next one. Uh, problem number two. 
it's a problem of application of the PKN equations. Basically, how to calculate uh, fracture length, uh, fracture width, and fracture pressure, net pressure uh, with time. I, I recommend that if you see this in the exam, you convert everything to SI units before, and then you convert them back to whatever unit you want or to whatever unit the problem asks for. But if you mix equations, uh, you mix some units here, uh, you may get a, a, wrong, ans a wrong answer. Uh, remember two some typical values for, for this one, right? For the length, usually, uh, very likely you're gonna get in the, the orders of hundreds of feet or more. For the width, it's gonna be very likely always less than one inch. If you get something more than that, it's gonna be very likely wrong, okay? And for the net pressure, it's gonna very likely, it's not gonna go above a thousand PSI. Uh, so, so remember, it's just going to be a few hundred PSI. It's, it's not going to be more like, uh, than that. Try to check always that your numbers make sense. Okay. So, uh, basically, in this case, you just have to uh, apply this equation. Probably the only uh, tricky step is to divide the injection rate. for one wing. So injection rate for two wings is 50, for one wing is going to be uh, 25. Uh, so this is the number, it was already converted, okay? But you need to use one wing injection rate. Other than that, everything is more or less straightforward. Yes? Is there what? These are just ge geometrical constants. Next time I write these uh, equations, I'm going to write the, the full equation. But this this is something like uh, pi over two or something like that. Because it was a little bit confusing because I wasn't sure if I should do it in the metric form or in the. In the As, no, th these are just numbers okay. without units. Okay. So all of these are unitless. But I recommend that you here you use the SI system, okay? So you, you plug in there all those numbers and, and you get these results, fracture length, uh, in this case, is about a mile, okay? That, that's something that makes sense. You're pumping for one hour. Uh, fracture width, it's about uh, five millimeters or quarter of an inch. So this is about one mile. This is about quarter of an inch. And the net pressure in this case is uh, this wrong. Is uh, 2.5 MPA. How many PSI is that? That would be two MPA, right? Two MPA. So it will be 290. Uh, this one would be more like uh, uh, 360 or so. So, uh, so you see here it's a few hundred psi. Usually it doesn't go uh, much higher than that. This part is relatively easy. Uh, the next part is relatively easy too, but uh, requires some other computations uh, out of those equations. The first thing that you have to do is to compute the fracture volume. In order to compute the fracture volume for one wing, you use this equation, average width times length times height, where this is the average width, is going to give you the total volume of the uh, fracture, uh, considering that just on volumetric computations, 90% of that is water. That's going to give you about 420 meter cubes, which is about four swimming pools. 10% of that is sand. And from here, to get from volume to uh, weight, you have to use the density of sand or the density 
of quartz, which is equal to 2.65 metric tons per meter cube. This is the same as 2.65 grams per centimeter cube. It's the same thing. And this is the same thing as 2.65, and this is the one I always remember because easy to remember, kilograms per liter, okay? So if you have a bottle of one liter, that would weight about uh, 2.65 kilograms or five pounds. All right, and with that, and considering that each truck is, uh, carries 10 metric tons, you get a, a about 13 trucks needed for this uh, hydraulic fracture job. And this is the end of this uh, problem number two. Any question about this one? Yes, Mr. So Ewa. Yeah, yeah, if you're considering the porosity, right? Yeah. But th these trucks, they don't care about how much volume or what is the porosity of the sand. They just care about the weight of the sand. No, but like when we're taking 10% volume from, uh, from the total. Yeah, so the assumption here is that if this is the mix of your fracture in fluid, it assumes that of that total volume, 90% is water and the other 10% in volume of just a solid phase is sand. The volume that, uh, that occupies in, uh, in bulk conditions in a truck, it's, uh, you, you don't take it into account here. That doesn't matter. It's just a weight. Okay? Uh, all right. So, Let's go to problem number three then. Uh, problem number three, it's a problem of, more of a design problem. So uh, you know what are the stress conditions. Uh, you know in which direction you have the minimum principal stress. And according to that, uh, you have to play, to place the lateral and the hydraulic fractures, right? And in this case, I gave you the spacing uh, between stages, the length of the fractures, and according to that, you're gonna have also the number of fractures, the length of your lateral. It doesn't matter if you drill here, you drill here, you end here, or, or you drill here and you end there, uh, unless I tell you that that doesn't matter, okay? But the important thing is to, to recognize in which direction the lateral goes according to the minimum principal stress. If I ask you to do multi-stage hydraulic fracture in a place with reverse faulting, would you drill laterals? It doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Because if you do that, you're not taking advantage of the multi-stage hydraulic fracturing. Uh, in that case, you just use a vertical wellbore and do it at different heights. If the formation is tall enough that you can place several fractures. Uh, okay, so let's see. Uh, the, I hope this one is more or less clear. Uh, the next step is to calculate the bottom hole pressure um, oh, the bottom hole pressure for having a net pressure equal to zero. So if net pressure is equal to zero, that means that the pressure in the fracture is equal to the minimum principal stress. So that the pressure is equal to S3. So basically what I'm asking you here is just basically to calculate S3, the minimum principal stress. And if that one is uh, a horizontal stress, 
like in normal faulting and reverse faulting, we have already seen these two equations. Both of those are possible solutions, okay? So for example, if, if, if you were to, to go uh, to work on hydraulic fracturing tomorrow, and somebody asks you what is the pressure needed uh, for hydraulic fracturing at uh, this place where the depth is this, already with these equations you could tell a reasonable estimate of what is the minimum principal stress. This is going to be the minimum principal effective stress, add pore pressure to that, that's the minimum principal stress, add a net pressure of a few hundred psi, that's how much uh, pressure you should have in your equipment in order to do this hydraulic fracturing job. Uh, so this is the elastic version. This is the equilibrium of faults, but in more theoretical terms, this is the plastic version. Remember, this is very important. If this is sigma, if this is strain, the first equation assumes that you are here, that your stress is proportional to strain. The second part assumes us that the rock has already been broken and that you are here. So this is elastic, this is the plastic. The stresses are not going to increase forever. There's going to be a point in which they're not going to increase anymore. Uh, all right. So uh, after you do that, I ask you to draw uh, in this stereo net plot uh, all the points where that deviated wellbore would go for this particular uh, direction, right? So starts here in the middle of the stereo net plot. This is a vertical wellbore, something like this. And uh, as it deviates into the pay zone, somewhere between here and there, it changes uh, angle until it gets into the pay zone into a lateral. And it's some, somewhere over here. Some of these laterals, they are not perfectly lateral. Sometimes they go up, they go down a little bit. Uh, so that point may not be exactly there. Yes, uh, Ms. Montero. Um, how do you know that it doesn't? So if I drew mine, like, same degrees, but in the, yeah, in the east and That's south. fine, that's fine. Oh, so either way. But if you do that, you should also draw this one according to your plot, right? So this is the version for this one starting here and ending there. Mm -hmm. If you draw another one that starts here and ends over here, then it should go in this direction. You should tell me uh, in this drawing which is a hill, which is a toe. Okay? But it's it's also it's also okay. All right, so I think that's the end of that problem, and the last one is about micro seismicity. So uh, this is a micro seismicity example with uh, three wells, uh, where they did completion with this type of zipper fracturing. Uh, each of these clouds with different colors, they tell you more or less, but not exactly how far the fractures went and how far the fractures went into changing the stresses in that location. Remember, each of these points, it's an event of shear reactivation. If there was a shear reactivation, it's because the stress has changed. And if the stress has changed, it's because either the pore pressure change or the stresses change at this location that made that uh, hydro uh, micro seismic event to happen. I'm not asking again here for very accurate answers, just you know to know how to interpret these kind of plots. So what you should see from here is what was the size of the stimulated zone that more or less each of these stages align in a shape that, for example, let's, let's look at the red one. It's a micro seismic cloud that is more or less like that, right? And this is more or less also telling you uh, what will be the expected 
orientation of the fracture. So if it's longer in this direction than in this one, very likely it went further into this direction than into that direction. It didn't grow into that direction, it grew into this direction. Notice here too that these fractures are not exactly perpendicular with the wellbore. Uh, I don't know, in this case, probably they didn't care about making the, the wellbores exactly perpendicular to the fracture. That's not a big issue, right? As long as your fractures grow uh, more or less parallel to each other, that, uh, that's, that's okay. Uh, but from here, you could tell what is the strike of these hydraulic fractures. So these hydraulic fractures, ideally, are going to be a plane which is more or less like this, with a strike that from the north, if this is the north, it's about 40, 50 degrees from the north towards the east, okay? And each of these planes, you have another one here, another one there, another one here. Uh, something else that you can notice from this uh, micro seismic uh, survey is that they seem to be very well defined close to here, but when you get to these things, which are faults, the micro seismic activity is not that as clear as before. Actually near faults, usually stresses tend to change, tend to align with the direction of the fault. So the state of stress near this fault very likely is not as simple as further away. In this particular case also, notice that although they drill through these faults in this location, they didn't do any stages in here. And that's because also they didn't want to reactivate all these faults. They didn't want to inject fluids in here. Uh, why they didn't do that? Uh, first, because uh, you may not want to uh, reactivate faults because that is going to produce uh, some seismicity which is gonna be larger than the one that you have over here. And second, because your hydraulic fracture simulation is not going to be effective. Most of your fluids and propane is just going to go into the faults. And in the faults, usually the rock is already drained. Uh, there are no hydrocarbons in there, so very likely in there, you're not going to have any production from there. So they did mostly the uh, simulation at the end of the, of the wellbore. So the length of the laterals, if this 400 feet, is about 10 times that. Uh, Jeffrey put here, 3,300 feet. Uh, the distance between stages, again, I'm not asking you for a very accurate number, but you see it's more or less between one square and two squares it depends where you are. So Jeffrey put here, it's uh, between 400 and 800, and the distance between laterals, it depends which one you're considering, but it varies between 400 also and 700, 600 feet. And the total simulated reservoir volume is about five squares uh, squares by five squares, so 2,000 by 2,000 times the height, which is 200 feet, it's all this uh, volume, which is, which is pretty large, right? So each of these squares is like more or less two football fields, right? So if we were to put the Long Horse Stadium over here, it will be something like this. And uh, the size of the stimulation is about five times five, five times five times that. If we were to comp to multiply multiplicate this bulk volume times porosity times recovery factor, you will get your EUR. Do you know what is the recovery factor? Uh, for shales. That's, that's usually, it depends what 
we're talking about. If we're talking about gas, it's usually a little bit higher, 30%, uh, 50%, 60%. But if you're, we're talking about oil, it's usually small, 5%, 10%, at most 10%. So can you guys multiply this, uh, multiply this number? The bulk volume times 0.1, we're gonna assume a porosity of 0.1 times the recovery factor of 0.1. Let's see what we get as EUR. Divided by 100, that 10 to the six. So that would be eight a million feet cube, feet uh, cube, right? Mm -hmm. Can you multiply that? Uh, to make it into barrels. So one barrel is, uh, how many feet cube? It's like five five something? Five okay. So, okay, let, let's make it easy. We're talking here about one million barrels, right? That will be the EUR that you will get uh, for this particular uh, completion job. Well, let's go a little bit further. Uh, what is going to be the price of that those one million barrels? Let's say with a fifty uh, dollars per barrel, that will be fifty. Uh, million dollars, right? Uh, let's, uh, well, you, we could do that, okay? But let's just make it simple. Uh, 50 million dollars, right? What do you think is the price of each of these wells and completion and everything? About how much? Each? about 10 million could be a little bit less sometimes uh, but let, let's say 10 million right so you spend three wells you spend 30 million dollars uh, you got a stock uh, price of 50 million you made 20 million dollars kind of makes sense all right so this is the end of this hydraulic fracturing uh, assignment uh, for the exam, remember the problems are going to be very similar, okay? Uh, if you did some problems with the computer, uh, try to uh, solve them also by hand, at least like, you know, one line. Uh, so, so you know that you're in full control of your equations. You, you know uh, how to put those numbers in. Especially for the stress log. If you did that in Excel, try to do one line by hand. Yes, this one there. I can I can do that. Yes, uh, I'll, I'll send you that. And uh, by the way, if you haven't seen that, I already posted a, a study guide with questions to study for for the exam. Right? Yes. I'm gonna put the conversions to it. Yeah. Yes. So we don't have 